I still remember seeing my first high definition display and I think it was 1125 line. For the time, it looked gobsmackingly good, but it was over 30 years later before I got to buy my own professional HD camera and had clients that wanted 1080 video. Progress like this often seems slow in TV. Admittedly, the switch to 4K has been a little quicker and TV manufacturers are already pushing 8K. But in my view, the biggest single advance you can make to massively improving your picture quality is largely being ignored by content creators. How many of your favourite tech channels are uploading in HDR? I bet it's roughly none. So I started to wonder why, and I think it might be because HDR is currently a bit of a mess. A mess of confusing international standards, competing formats and the sort of technical jargon that only engineers could love. This confusion is preventing HDR from reaching that tipping point of acceptance. It's like most people can't be bothered. So let's try and tip things the other way and simplify HDR for your YouTube videos. I know there's a lot of professional colorists out there who will probably hate the idea of us oversimplifying their speciality. And I expect they'll soon be letting me know how little I know about HDR. I do realize that if you're professionally grading a high budget cinema release or a Netflix drama, then you might want to know exactly what REC 2100 ST2084 and an electro optical transfer function is. You might also think it's essential to have a properly calibrated £30,000 Sony reference monitor as well. But for the rest of us mere mortals, we'll just have to make do and make things as simple as possible. However, there is one little technical term we do need to agree on. The nit. It's just a measure of brightness. Imagine a candle placed in the middle of a cube with a total surface area of one square meter. One nit is the total level of brightness hitting the insides of that cube. If you could fit a hundred candles inside that cube, it would be a hundred nits. And because we're dealing with the light hitting an area squared, the scale isn't linear, it's logarithmic. So 1000 nits isn't 10 times brighter than 100 nits on a waveform because we're talking about the light hitting an area squared. Traditional standard dynamic range TV was often just 8-bit with a small REC 709 color space, a gamma curve of about 2.4 and brightness that went from 0% black to 100% peak white. Originally that was 100% of 1 volt. But I don't want to confuse things. So for the sake of argument, let's think of it as 0 to 100 nits. I know it's not the same thing, but go with me here. We've got 10 or even 12 bit now, so smoother colours. A much larger REC 2020 colour space, PQ or HLG gammas. They're not really gammas in the old sense, but I'll come on to that. And a brightness that can go from naught to 10,000 nits. It does sound ridiculously bright, but remember this is a logarithmic scale. Plus I don't think there's any 10,000 nit TVs around yet. To give you some idea, this Atomos Ninja will display 1,000 nits, and my MacBook Pro here will show 1,600 nits. The TV in my living room goes all the way up to 2,000 nits. So at the moment, a peak brightness of 1000 nits sounds like a good compromise to aim for when you're grading HDR pictures. It's plenty bright enough. But how do we cope with all of these different HDR displays with different levels of brightness? Well, you know earlier when I said the HDR gammas weren't really gamma curves. Well, they sort of are gamma curves, uh, but now we call them transfer functions. Or to be more precise, when we're dealing with displays, electro-optical transfer functions. At the moment, we've got two main flavors, PQ or perceptual quantization or HLG, 
hyperlog gamma. PQ deals with absolute values tailored for your input or your output display device. And as an example, if we're sending 10-bit data to a 1,000-nit display, we know that a luminance data value of, say, 500 should produce 82 nits of brightness on the screen. Unlike PQ, HLG does not deal with absolute values. Instead, it uses a gamma curve, the hyperlog one, which is related to the peak brightness of your screen. This means the luminance values are relative to the display. Now, I realize that many people like using HLG. It looks good in camera, and the original intention was that anything mastered in HLG should look okay on both SDR and HDR displays. This is because up to about 200 nits, there's very little difference between the SDR and the HDR curves. However, to my eyes, I think HLG looks worse than SDR on an SDR screen and doesn't realize the full potential of HDR on an HDR screen. So if each display has the correct transfer function, ideally PQ, we should be sorted for all of our displays. And if you start sending your nice 1000 nit picture to a display that can't cope with that brightness, there's also tone mapping. But I'm going to ignore that right now. Remember, we're trying to keep it simple. Just for fun, looking at this picture, which square do you think is the brightest? A or B? Obviously, it looks like A, but I can assure you they're both exactly the same. When we're trying to assess the highlights in an image, it's really difficult if we don't know the relative brightness of the display. Now, the joy of nits in a PQ gamma is that, unlike percentages, they specifically define how bright something on any TV should be. If all TV manufacturers use the same tone mapping, which clearly they don't, then 500 nits should be an absolute value on any HDR display. But there's one more factor that's complicating HDR production way more than it should. And that's another format battle. First, we've got HDR10, which is open source. So almost every HDR TV manufacturer includes it for free. It uses embedded metadata to tell your TV things like the maximum, minimum and average brightness levels, the white point and even the transfer functions. But this metadata is static, which means it's the same for the whole file or the film or the show that you're watching. You get the idea. Then there's Dolby Vision format, which is licensed and costs money for TV manufacturers to include. So let's do. And that's a shame because it looks terrific. And the big advantage of Dolby Vision is that the format contains dynamic metadata. So you can have different picture settings and brightness for each scene or even each frame in your movie. However, we've now got a new version of HDR10 called HDR10+. Plus, and this also includes dynamic metadata and is arguably almost as good as Dolby Vision. The trouble is none of these talk very well to each other, if at all. So if your TV isn't compatible with the film you want to watch, you may be watching something with static metadata or it's possibly tone mapped and not quite the HDR experience you were expecting. However, at this point, I think we need to stop. I'm falling into the same trap that everybody falls into when trying to describe HDR. Tell you what, just forget all of that, apart from the nit bit. If you're on Final Cut 10 with an Apple Silicon MacBook Pro or XDR display, simply open a new library as normal. Let's call this HDR demo. And the first thing you want to do is go to the library properties and modify that so you've got wide gamut HDR. You can import your raw or log footage, which obviously now looks flat and dull. And then start your new project. I'm shooting 2160. Now, a lot of these professionals will tell you that it's not worth rendering HDR at anything less than 4444XQ. But for what we're doing, any 10-bit codec should be enough. I'm choosing ProRes 422 because I'm going to be uploading this to YouTube. 
So the file size is important. Now, the all important color space. We need to record in Wide Gamma HDR Rec 2020 PQ. And now we can start to drag our footage onto the timeline. It still looks dull because Final Cut doesn't know what color space or gamma we shot this in. So straight up to the inspector and we can input the LUT. For me this was shot Sony S-Log3 S-Gamma3 Cine. You might not see the camera LUT option appear unless you run the general tab rather than basic. Already we're looking pretty good but we can start to grade these pictures as normal. The main problem you'll have is where to put what we used to call peak white in SDR. It used to be 100 nits, but if you do that now, it'll look dull in HDR, especially in things like graphics. What we need to do with HDR PQ is put this diffused white at 203 nits. Just trust me, a bright white piece of paper will look right at 203 nits on an HDR screen. If I'm using Final Cut on my laptop, I tend to have two monitors, a larger cheap SDR one for the timeline, and then I use the laptop XDR screen for my HDR preview. When we come to rendering, the most important thing is that HDR has to be in at least 10 bit. Final Cut setting should show wide gamut HDR Rec 2020 PQ. And just make sure the codec you're using, the output codec, is 10-bit. However, I now prefer to do most of my workflow in DaVinci Resolve. Start a new project. I'll call this HDR Demo again. The first thing you want to do is go to the Project Settings. Although your options can look more complicated, the settings for simple HDR are much the same. I'm still on 2160 UHD resolution and 25 frames per second because it's obviously the best. But the important page is under Color Management. Actually, Resolve's Color Management is really good. So let's choose that as the Color Science. Might as well leave the automatic on, and obviously we need to process in HDR. The output color space needs to be HDR PQ as before, and we're gonna limit our HDR mastering to 1000 nits. Hit Save, and we can load in our footage. Now in theory, Resolve can read the metadata from your footage and apply the right input color space automatically. It depends on your camera, but I've found it doesn't always get this right. So what you can do is click on any clip and go to input color space. Choose the format you shot this in, Sony S-Log3 S Gamma 3 Cine again, and we're away. You need to shoot your HDR footage in 10 bit or even greater. And it should be with a camera that can record a wide color gamut. RAW would be perfect, but any 10-bit version of log is more than enough to get you started. Now, a lot of people will tell you that an HDR picture is simply brighter. But that's only true for the brightest parts of the image. The brightness should only be brighter in the highlights. From black until the mid-ranges, the gamma and the brightness of an HDR screen is much the same as an SDR display. It's only when you get way above 200 nits towards the real highlights that you realize how much range you've got to play with. You might find it easier to think of HDR as expanding the brightness range of just the top half of the standard picture, so nothing should clip, which is really liberating. Once you get used to it, you won't want to go back. HDR will have better and possibly more saturated colors because you're using a bigger color space. And the only reason the black levels look darker is because the tech used in HDR displays, like OLED and Mini LED, produce physically darker blacks. But this is a display thing. The additional contrast also makes things look sharper, but these are just added benefits of HDR. If HDR was simply a brighter picture, we wouldn't be able to watch it for too long because it's physically tiring for your eyes. Think of it as basically an SDR picture, but with a massively increased range at the top for highlights. So now we can see details in the clouds, in lights, and in anything bright. Resolve's Deliver page also does everything for you, and it'll follow the timeline project settings. The best thing is that Resolve will also allow you to render in H.265, which is 10-bit. 
and YouTube now accepts that for HDR. When YouTube gets your file, it'll transcode an SDR version for your viewers. In fact, it'll do that first, and it can take quite a while for the HDR version to appear. I'm sometimes talking days here, so don't panic when you don't see it straight away. You can make your own LUT and force YouTube to use that for the HDR to SDR conversion, but once again, it all gets quite complicated, and to be honest, I've always been impressed by YouTube's default settings. It's been getting a lot better recently and now does a good job. Now, at this point, I expect you want me to show you some lovely comparisons of HDR versus SDR footage. Unfortunately, I can't do that. It's impossible, because you're either watching this on an HDR screen, or you're not. You can't be watching one video on both together. Anyway, I don't want to pretend I'm any good at colour grading, because the purpose of making this video is to encourage you to give HDR a try. It doesn't have to be as complicated as some other people want it to sound, and it doesn't even have to be technically perfect. It just has to look better than SDR, which isn't difficult, and you might actually enjoy it. There's no going back. Remember, there'll come a time when it becomes the new normal for everyone. And anyone who has a MacBook Pro with Apple Silicon already has a great HDR screen, or most new TVs, or an Atomos Ninja, or even a later smartphone. Are we now at a point where the majority of people are already watching this very video on an HDR display? It could be. I always knew you were special. Thanks for watching.